Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Morell. So Alex is a physiotherapist who worked for nine years in professional rugby, and there he encountered his fair share of ACL injuries. But since then, he's moved on to private practice, where he works at Move Physiotherapy Clinics. So who better today to discuss ACL injuries than Alex? So without further ado, it's time to welcome him onto the show. So Alex, welcome to the Science Support Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, pleasure to be here. Been really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Excellent. So can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you've been up to until now? Uh, of course. So my name's Alex Morell um, and sort of my background is in strength and conditioning and, and sports science. And then I did a master's in, in physiotherapy and Along that sort of journey, I was I was always sort of rehab physio focused and um, was picking up different roles, like as a, as a student uh, within sport, primarily professional rugby. And then coming out of uh, my master's, I was lucky enough to, to get a fantastic mentor in, in Dave O'Sullivan um, and worked for him alongside some part-time roles and then went into to professional full-time rugby, firstly with Yorkshire Carnegie, and then transitioned over to their sister club, Leeds Rhinos, and, and worked for as a consultant physio for, for England Rugby League. Um, so all in all, I think I was in and out of uh, professional sport in, in one capacity or another for, for nine years. And then the last couple of years, I've just sort of transitioned after lockdown into running move physiotherapy and, and performance as it is now. And that is the the day-to-day -day now. So it's sort of still uh, supporting elite level professional athletes uh, on a one-to-one -one capacity, but serving the the wider public and and hopefully providing them the the level of of care and, and standard uh, of care and um, that you would see in a professional environment, really. Absolutely perfect. And obviously, we're we're going to discuss ACL injuries today. Um, yes. Is that something that came came to the fore a little bit during your time with rugby? Uh, it is, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it, for, for one reason or another. It, uh, it's always been a special interest of mine. And I think that is as a result of maybe more of the, the strength and condition and sports science background and the longer term planning nature of it and, and how you can be far and not that you wouldn't be any less objective with other sort of smaller injuries, quote unquote, but it, it, it allows that sort of longer term plan and um, complexity and comprehensiveness of, of actually making a, a real tangible change to the, the person, given the, the fact that you're going to have nine to 12 months to, to rehab them and, and recondition them. So then when we're looking at, at ACLs, like before we get into all of the, the rehab stuff and how to, to phase that in, like what is an ACL and what does it do? Uh, to keep it as simple as possible, so if you think you, you have four major ligaments of the knee, um, two which sit uh, more superficially on the inside and the outside, so the, the medial and the lateral collateral ligaments, uh, and then two in the middle of the knee joint, intra-articularly, and that is the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, is the, the most sort of commonly injured out of them. Um, and it's obviously the most talked after, talked about. It's the most documented within the, the press. So people are more, um, are, are a little bit more aware of it. And it's essentially its role is to stop the, the shin bone, the tibia, translating forward on the um, femur, the thigh bone. Uh, that is its primary function. And, and unfortunately, um, for I'm sure we'll come on to a number of different reasons, it is relatively commonly injured and. Um, it can be a, a significant change to the, the person's season and, and career, really. And obviously, yeah, like <laughs> it's a year out, effectively, a uh, whole season. Um, yeah, that could have huge career impact. So I think it's, it's important to, to kind of try and avoid it, right? So with, with that in mind, what are the mechanisms which cause the injury and how do people go about preventing that? That's a, a very, it's a myriad of answers there. I think like, you will fall into two typical camps from a, an ACL injury perspective. You will have a contact and a non-contact. Um, non-contact, so I would have always said non-contact, and I don't know the actual data on this, but the non-contact was a more common injury. Um, but as sort of we've worked with more contact-based uh, athletes, particularly in like grappling sports and things like that, obviously it's it's a, a little bit more heavily weighed in, in that sense at the moment. But 
from a, a contact sport perspective, it is essentially a loss of control into a dynamic um, valgus. And there, and there what, are what a lot does of dynamic it. valgus mean for people who so don't essentially necessarily know? The, essentially the knee bowing in, in inside of the, the midline. Um, it's combined with some rotation at the knee. Sometimes you can end up with a hyperextension injury, which which can cause it. There, there are a number of different um, ways and mechanisms that the ACL can go, but they typically come from an uncontrolled incident when landing or cutting within a multidirectional sport. Um, obviously, it can happen, unfortunately, with bad luck, just in day-to-day and, and, and even in the gym, like... Weirdly, I never sort of associated it with it, but there there are more and more CrossFit athletes, like even in like your like Sag some plane linear type movements that are having that loss of control and, and experiencing that. And we, we saw someone sort of recently and unfortunately it put them out of the opportunity to go to the CrossFit Games this year. Um and then similar mechanisms uh from a contact perspective, but obviously the the speed of the movement's slightly slower. Um but the, the force has increased and it is always a balance between those sort of metrics and, and physical qualities really that for one reason or another, there is a, a loss of control and uh, tissue damage occurs. And how, how, do, how do we go about avoiding that? Because it sounds really, <laughs> like it's a really complicated mechanism, but are there ways in which you can then reduce your risk of, of having that kind of injury? Yeah, definitely. Like the underpinning um, injury reduction uh, principle is to just get stronger and it will it will serve you in the long run and it is a very simplified way of looking at things but the the stronger your quads are your hamstrings are your calf is the the adductors abductors and things like that it's only going to serve you but a big nuance of that is actually how you apply that force and and a lot of the biomechanics mechanics movement control aspects of that and there is more and more sort of research coming out um particularly from a if for people who may be interested the, the the biggest influence on my practice from an acl perspective is a guy called uh ender king who used to head up um the sports medicine and performance um center at santry over in dublin and he, i think he's now at aspatar i always get the two of them mixed up over there but i, I believe he is a, a, a aspatar and he has a number of different online courses and, and in-person options and things like that. But he has had a, a massive influence on my practice, looking at sort of lumbar pelvic me- mechanics, how the foot and ankle in- integrating with the floor uh, and interacting with the floor impacts what's going on at the knee, at, at sort of above and below, um, the impact of sort of trunk lean and how that can place excessive force in, in different directions. And it's, it is like as a, as a broader topic for the general population, they need to get stronger, but actually then how that force is applied is a huge, huge factor within the, uh, the injury reduction system or re- injury reduction program that you, you may run. And like, obviously when those injuries have happened, then they've happened, right? You can't just turn the time back and, and change it. So, um, I think that there's more interesting research coming out about potentially non-surgical options uh, compared to surgical options. So can you speak to the the pros and cons of those different types as well? Yeah, I suppose a lot of it comes down to which lens that you're you're looking at it through, whether that is a athlete or whether that's a a, a non-athlete and time comes into that stage of the season, importance of fixtures coming up and and things like that. But there are a number of reported cases of people who have had an ACL injury, been unaware of it and continue to to play in their sport at whatever level that may be. There are even, there's there's a guy, um, a professional rugby player in Australia three or four years ago who injured, knew he'd injured his ACL uh, today, for example, went through full battery of testing, passed it all and played in the fixture the following week. Um, There's a West Ham footballer um, who also sort of fell into this category. They're called Copers, um, who basically have the physical qualities um, such as strength, movement control, et cetera, et cetera, um, to cope without having an ACL. Um, And he returned to play in the Premier League without an ACL, both of which I believe have actually gone and had surgery uh, later on in their career. Um, But again, it, it, it sort of throws up that argument of, is there an acceptable level of risk to take as long as we can pass the appropriate physical tests that will allow you to play in this important 
fixture or in this important period. I think the West Ham player played the end of the season and actually sort of saved or was part of the team saving them from relegation. Um, so it's it, it is a it is a line and a discussion which can become quite complex at times. But certainly from a, a non sort of elite level athlete perspective, my I always think about this from my perspective of what I would do because I am by no means an elite level athlete, but stay very, very active and play and compete in a number of different sports. I wouldn't rush into having surgery because I believe one, you would want, or I would want to know if I fell into that category of coping, but also if I go through that process I and have an effective sort of rehab program, whatever that may be, but unfortunately need to have surgery. I'm actually in a better position going into the surgery um, because I'm in no immediate rush to have the surgery and return to sport and return to play. Again, it is a, a discussion on a case-by-case -case basis. A, a younger person may be like, right, desperate to get back and that's everything to them. It's a huge part of their identity and enjoyment and fulfillment out of life. Um, but yeah, there's there's... there's it is a very interesting topic and discussion. There are there is some new emerging research now that an ACL can heal. Um, it's a very 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 inconvenient protocol. You have to be braced at ninety degrees for I think six to twelve between six and twelve weeks. Um, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it's it's a very very inconvenient um, protocol. But there is some decent research emerging around that. And again, the longitudinal application of that is unknown yet because the studies are still in their infancy. But it is a, it isn't a, as clear cut as I have my uh, ACL injury and therefore I have to have surgery. Um, there are a number of different considerations around the physical qualities that may predispose someone to to be able to cope. I think that's a really interesting point that it's potentially different for per person and per sport and yeah, per situation. I mean, you've got the Champions League final next week and you, you happen to be able to be able to play in it, then yeah, I can imagine that's pretty tempting. But yeah, if uh, if like me, you're, you're playing amateur football with a bunch of expats who are uh, sat there just having a laugh, then I'm probably... Uh, probably take a little bit of more relaxed opinion about 100%. it. And this is the thing, like say uh, Erling Haaland injures his ACL the, the week before, you're going to want him on the pitch. So you're going to want to push the boundary as far as possible. And then there's, there is also the discussion of, like, you've passed all of these tests, but these are the, the, the potential risks to you as the person and as the athlete. Like, you don't have an ACL, so structural integrity is compromised. We haven't had long enough to actually challenge you under fatigue and, and, and challenge you with environmental factors of other players and the ball and, and, and things like that. And it's then the person's decision. You can only, as the practitioner, you can only educate them as far as possible. Like, like the chances of other MCI, other ligament injuries, meniscus type injuries happening. No, I don't know the percentage uh, risk going up, but it, it is associated with a risk, and it's it's the level of risk that someone might be be willing to take, I suppose. I can imagine, especially for for the weekend warriors, that that risk might be quite large. So. It's That's not why necessarily... I wanted to mention that. <laughs> yeah, 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 good, good, good. So, like, I didn't, not... I didn't want people, people listening to this going, "I've injured my ACL," but Alex actually said there are people who can cope. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there is a, an element of risk of making things worse and, and potentially compromising your your longer term health. So, so let's imagine you do take that surgery, right? So you, you're going to get the surgery and you're going to start to to do your rehab. Um, what are the important stages? which you think that athletes need to consider or physios need to consider in this stage? And how, how would you then build that up through time? For me, the, if you can sort of prehabilitate, prehab the injury as best as possible, um, you're winning. Uh, the, the, the research suggests that, that from a, a muscular inhibition and, and atrophy perspective, you're losing about 5% five, five per day uh, when you're just sort of at rest. Obviously, with ACL, you want to get going pretty quickly, but still, you're just slowing that decline. You're not completely reversing it. And like anyone that's had a, a big major knee surgery, I'm sure that they, they will laugh at the bag of custard description of uh, quads that you end up with after about two or three weeks. Um, but yeah, the, the more you can offset that in the, the prehab stage and build as much muscle tissue and, and go into that surgery with this as quiet joint, i.e., 
limited swelling, full range of motion, not red, not hot, uh, and you're actually able to get some loading through it. Like that, that's a big thing for me. And sometimes some really good surgeons will actually allow a delay from a, a surgical perspective because they want to allow that knee to come in as quiet as possible. Like if you go in with a big raging knee and they then do loads of surgery, rooting about in there, moving stuff, drilling stuff and things like that, it's only going to come out off the back of that in a, in a potentially worse position. Um, and then after that, it's that first sort of four to six weeks period. Do you want to get to a point where after four to six weeks, ideally four, you have a quiet knee. So as little swelling as possible, no redness, no heat. You've got full extension back and that is with like a hyper extension. A nice simple test for anybody in that uh, scenario is sitting on the floor with their legs out in front of them, squeezing the quads as hard as they can, trying to push the knees down and popping the heels off the floor naturally. Um, and it is the, the squeezing of the quads and pushing the knees down into extension, which should sort of subconsciously pop the heels off and comparing the two. And it's not, it's no need to panic if they're not there quite by that point, but that is a, a really key aim. Uh, around 120 degrees knee flexion, again, give or take. It's not something that people need to hang their hat completely on, but that's what they're working towards. And then just a, a normal gait cycle as possible. Um, and that may come under the sort of restrictions of if you've had a meniscal repair alongside it and your weight bearing status and things like that. Uh, but there, there's some really, really sort of tangible things to work on because that just lays that foundation that allows you then for the next sort of eight to 12 week block building back ideally towards return to running that you can just do the basics really 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 well consistently every day um, and build the muscle tissue back build the strength back and then sort of transition into your return to run phase with your plyometrics and things things like that but i think like a a really really key principle that we encourage all of our athletes and clients to think about from a, any sort of longer term rehab perspective is the level of overall performance that you are currently at has let you down from an injury perspective. Yes, there's a huge degree of luck in there. Um, yes, there is a, a number of other factors, but contact, non-contact, but view it as it's like a, this has let me down at this point. And that might be aerobic capacity, max, absolute strength, absolute power, whatever physical quality we want to consider. We want to overall improve our level of, of um, performance over this rehab period. And we have a, a user phrase of every injury is an opportunity. And very, very early on, we want to establish key performance goals outside of the, the rehab-based goals that we can allow our clients to scratch the itch of pushing their performance and knowing that they're going to come back fitter, faster, stronger, because they're like undoubtedly with a long-term injury, there's a huge amount of doubt and anxiety of, am I going to come back the same? Am I going to do that? But actually, if we can facilitate increasing levels of confidence by hitting PBs on upper body tests and hitting PBs on the um, unaffected side, and we'll come on to that in a sec, but and aerobic gains and, and they're going to come back in a better place to actually perform at the, the standard or above that they need to perform but also then their likelihood of injury is re reducing as their overall performance is is uh is increasing because one of the big big mistakes that that we see and it, it is particularly common across longer term injuries is is returning uh, to sport with a reduced aerobic capacity and cardiovascular fitness. And if you think about it practically, you return to sport and previously you played an 80 minute sport, so rugby, you were at max fatigue at 80 minutes. You have a diminishing amount of cardiovascular fitness and then you're at complete fatigue by 60, but you've got 20 minutes still to play. Your strength's reduced, your capacity reduced, your control's reduced, and your likelihood of injury or potential for injury is just rising within that. And it's a it's a massive oversight. Like it's even in the name, like strength and conditioning. Everyone yeah. goes during a long term injury, right? I need to restore my strength and I need to restore my power. But actually, like even just maintenance from a conditioning perspective, but it's a huge opportunity to to develop it as a physical quality. So it's a, a massively valuable thing to, to to look at it through that lens of right i'm good it's an opportunity for me to increase my overall level of performance 
absolutely excellent. And I'm, I'm interested as well to see how you've done this in real life, right? So can you take us through like a case study of going through different phases to improve that, like you said, improve performance, but at the same time, rehab someone back? So I think looking at, particularly in the early stages from a rehab perspective, look at it as two separate programs, which can be run concurrently at the same time alongside each other. And as early as possible, and this is also that the, the value within having a decent sort of prehab period is you can test some of these physical qualities pre-injury um, and actually establish some baselines and like straight away or within sort of 10, 14 days post-surgery, you should be clear to sweat and your surgeon will clear that from a wound healing perspective and things like that. Then you can be doing seated ski erg, arms only air bike, albeit it's horrible to do, but actually you're starting to develop the sort of uh, cardiovascular fitness side of things on those modalities. And obviously as you transition through your rehab, you're gonna transition onto the bike and then you're gonna transition through um, return to running and then you return to running rather than it being rehab focused, it's going to become performance focused. So you can you can use varying modalities to develop those physical qualities, but also to prep for the next stage from a rehab perspective. Like I might start introducing some like um, power output or repeatability type intervals on the uh, watt bike or a, a bike erg where we're increasing the speed of movement, the rate of force development, the, the the physical demands prior to someone transitioning into tempo running or high speed running. And again, I, I'm not aware of any sort of like scientific research that looks at it, but common sense tells me if I can do those things well in a, a reduced weight bearing capacity, like the, the musculature, musculature is going to be prepped better when they start having to ex being exposed to those speeds and forces as their running speeds are increasing. And it's the same principle from a strength side of things. Yes, we have very, very clear goals and checklists that we want people to hit as exit criteria from phase one, which is that sort of first four to six weeks, which we spoke about and the, having a quiet knee and, and all the extension, the flexion based goals to more capacity-based goals and a single leg sit to stand for sort of a minimum of 25, 30 reps, hamstring, single leg hamstring break, single leg calf raise. But these are all physical qualities and tests which are prepping someone to then go into some lower level running. And we know that they're, they're going to be at appropriate levels of strength and capacity to tolerate that. And then as the, the program starts to develop and it, it, it starts to emerge a lot more, particularly as you get into that later stage and it effectively replicates a, a performance program where you are therefore that they're, they're at that point from an injury perspective, trying to hit some of the, the higher end performance goals that might be something like um, a single leg counter movement jump comparing limb symmetry and, and left versus right or unaffected versus effective a reactive uh, power, so like a, a single leg drop jump. Um, and that also allows you to gain some more information from the subjective side of things and the, the art of uh, coaching and rehab of actually, right, how do you look when you, you're doing that from a biomechanics perspective and a, a movement control perspective? How are you producing the force? So you're actually able to flex the knee confidently as you hit the floor and rebound back off, or is it a very hip dominant movement and you're using a forward lean through the trunk? And it, it, it is, for me, it's starting as two separate programs that run concurrently and serve each other and slowly merge into a performance program, which then from a, 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 a full-time sport, a professional sport perspective, it goes into that handover period uh, to, a, to yourself, the strength and conditioning coach, um, or in a, a more sort of um, traditional population approach, you might transition uh, to a performance coach, a strength coach, or uh, um, a specific sport coach, whatever that may be. Absolutely excellent. So based on all of those things, what are your top tips for, let's say, the, the everyday athlete, not necessarily the, 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 uh, the best stars who are, who are getting probably very expensive and very good care, but the everyday Weekend Warrior, what are your top tips when they're coming out of that ACL uh, period? 
get the prehab right. That's a big one. And don't be, I actually view that as a, as an opportunity as well. Like, it's particularly people who have to wait for NHS waiting lists and stuff like that. I completely understand how frustrating it is, but actually again, view it through the lens of what can I do? Not what can't I do? Um, then get the first four weeks right. If the, the people that I have met that have had a problem have rushed the first four weeks, they've not let the knee settle, they've not restored like the basic functions of extension and flexion um, and, and being able to walk effectively. And then after that, it's having a very, very clear plan of what you need to do to progress through each phase of rehab. And what, what we do with our clients is we have a North Star of what we want a healthy and high performing person or athlete to look like. And we talk them through what that looks like. And, and then we talk them through what each phase looks like. So they're very, very aware and have complete clarity and confidence of what they need to do to get from stage one stage two, which is more of a strength and, and um, hypertrophy phase, then what do they need to tick off there to get back into that return to running? What do they need to tick off there to get back into return to training? What do they need to tick off there to get into return to play and performance? And the, one of the biggest mistakes that, that I really should mention is your rehab doesn't finish when you've returned to play. Like the the speed at which people's return to play testing will drop off if they just ditch everything they've been doing is quite surprising. And we, we will check up with people who have returned to play one month after, three months after, and six months after and go through our full testing battery again. One, from an accountability perspective, but two, from a, a health and performance perspective. Like we know these markers serve people from preventing injuries and improving performance and whatever program you go on to do from there has to have some really key things like like people, one of the really common things with ACLs is quad strength. And we're getting people back after three months who haven't ticked those boxes from a simple leg extension and, and um, Spanish squat type quad, quad focused exercises. And they're having 20% drop offs and it's putting them into like an at risk category. And we, we can talk, it's probably a different discussion actually like, limb symmetry and, and, and the, the value of it. But like we want everyone to be within 10% left versus right with all the testing that we do. Um, and they're, they're dropping off to 20%. And in theory, like they're not safe to play. Like we don't stop them playing. It just re-emphasize some of the, the, the key things they need to work on to keep their knee as healthy as, as possible in the long run. Absolutely. Excellent advice. So Alex, massive thanks for your time and effort today. I really appreciate it. Where can people find a little bit more about you and what you're up to? Uh, the easiest place would be Instagram. Uh, my handle is Alex Morell uh, Physio. So it's M O R R E W -L, L Physio. Um, and feel free to, to drop me a message on there. I'm always keen to talk, keen to inter interact and connect with people and, and, and talk things through. Absolutely fantastic. Alex, massive thanks today. I really appreciate it and look forward to speaking again soon. Pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Cheers, everybody. And that's it once again. A massive thanks to Alex for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. and I'm sure you do at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science of Sport Coach Academy. Now, the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses, which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. And that means you can fit it in and around your busy coaching schedule. And in addition, when you complete a course, you get a certificate of completion, which means you can prove your ongoing education. So if you're interested in getting yourself into the Science of Sport Coach Academy, you can do so completely free using the link in the show notes in just a few seconds time. And of course, if you have enjoyed today's podcast, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. And that means that we can keep bringing the best possible guests and the best possible content. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks from me. I'm Matt Solomon for Science of Sport, and I'll speak to you next week.